Good evening and welcome. I said I wasn't going to cover Ukraine till the news coming from the war theater were not going to be relatively reliable. And now we have some. We are going to discuss air superiority above the Ukraine, and this will be a technical video, but we must not forget that what we are talking about is not theory and is not a game. This is a terrible situation that is killing thousands of people and is ruining millions of lives. So this is going to be short and serious, no artists, no fancy graphics, no jokes. The comment section as usual is open to everyone, but please keep the debate civilized. So on the 11th of March, the Pentagon published some interesting intelligence about the conflict in the Ukraine, and US intelligence has been pretty much spot on in this war. I also have the possibility to access some Italian press sources that generally are quite reliable, that pretty much confirm what the American published. So the Russians are flying currently about 200 sorties a day. If this was a number generated by a Western coalition, we would have to consider that probably the at least two thirds of those would be tankers, uh, OAXs, uh, or any other form of support aircraft. In the case of Russians, they have way fewer of those. The Ukraine is reported to have about 56 combat aircraft still available of the original 70, and they're flying on average five to 10 sorties a day. So the Ukrainian are definitely not flying much. And when they tried a surge with the Suhoi 27, they lost five or six aircraft within 48 hours. The Russians on the other side now seem to be very cautious and they tend to use quite a lot of long range weapons from the comfort of their airspace. So many of those 200 sorties, they don't even reach the Ukraine. And mind, this is quite different from the first uh, four or five days when they were flying just 60, 70 sorties a day. From all these numbers are excluded the helicopters, so these are fixed wing sorties. The most effective part of the Ukrainian Air Force seems to be the drones, apparently because, well, they have a, inherently a small RCS, they can fly low, so they are not readily identified on the long-range radar, so they can get close to the ground forces and they have scored a number of successes. So the drone contrast is left to the local short-range and medium-range air defenses. It also seems that the Ukrainian drones managed to attack some Russian helicopters in flight, and if these news are actually confirmed, this is probably a world first. So after the blunders of the first three, five days, now the Russians have their integrated air defenses in place, and they cover most of the sky above the western Ukraine. The Ukrainian air defenses have been severely hit, but they are still effective in some areas with medium range and long range weapons. Albeit it seems that slowly, very slowly, but the Russian air force is actually disabling these defenses. And yes, at low altitude, the manpath's uh, danger is real. The US estimate of the Russian fixed wing losses so far are around 60 aircraft, but this is an estimate with quite low confidence because it's very difficult to verify autonomously. It is probably the case that Russian losses are lower than this, but anyway, in a couple of weeks, is still quite a relatively high attrition rate. So these are some facts that seem to be reasonably acquired. Now, in the previous days, we have seen some interesting analysis that were actually trying to explain how and why the Russians did not acquire air superiority above the Ukraine. And indeed, some of the points made are probably correct. The Russian pilots are less trained than the Western equivalents, but probably so are the Ukrainian, to be honest. The Russian Air Force is numerous, but it is lacking a suppression of air defenses units. The Russians do have anti-radiation and anti-radar weapons, even relatively effective, but they don't have specialists or so 
does it seem that could use them in the most effective way. Also, the problem of coordinating the Air Force with the air defenses seems to be real. I mean, this has been documented in pre-war exercises and even publicly discussed on the Russian military literature, so we don't expect that the problem actually disappeared. If I have to have a look at the numbers that we have given before, 10 mission against 200, it sort of looks like air superiority to me. The Russian Air Force paid quite a high price for this air superiority, but it seems that now they have achieved it. The Ukrainian Air Force is staying mostly on the ground and the airspace is not denied to the Russians. The strange element is that the Russians are establishing this air superiority not through their fighters that fly caps on the occupied territory, but through their integrated air defenses that now have been brought forward and having those extremely long range, they cover most of the Ukrainian territory, surely the entirety of the Western Ukraine. This is a textbook example of asymmetry. The Russians are not doing what the Western analysts and the Western observers were expecting, but they still achieved the result. Granted, this operation was nowhere near as impressive as some Western operations like, for example, Desert Storm No. 1, and the Russians have definitely paid quite a high price. The attrition level was quite high, but we can't really say that they are failing. I also believe that there are some empirical facts that tell us that the Russians do have air superiority. For example, consider the main Ukrainian request. It was establish a no-fly zone. Why asking for a no-fly zone if the enemy's air superiority wasn't your key concern? Once it was clear that the Ukrainians were not getting a no-fly zone, what did they ask for? The Polish MiG-29. Why asking for planes as your main request if the enemy air force wasn't your key concern? Probably the most convincing indication that the Russians indeed have air superiority is the fact that for at least an entire week there has been an enormous traffic jam north of Kiev with all the units trying to enter the Ukraine and not being capable of actually moving. That traffic jam wasn't attacked. Or better, there have been attacks, but you would expect the entire Ukrainian Air Force trying to serve and create the highway of death 2.0. Nothing like that happened. A reasonable explanation is the Russians indeed have air superiority. And while I'm editing this video, here comes the news that the United States are trying to collect around the world all the S-300 systems that they can find and uh, their rounds. The Pentagon report there was a note actually stating how these Russian-made systems behaved quite well in the hands of the Ukrainian if they managed to survive the first strike. We'll see the developments. So I thought these facts and these considerations are quite important because they don't align closely with the mainstream narrative, so I offer them to you for your consideration. If you like this video, you may be interested in the videos that are going to appear beside me. Thank you very much for watching and see you there.